Okay, well, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us for our third session of the First Fridays with Fairbanks series. The First Fridays with Fairbanks series is made possible by the IU Alumni Association and the Richard Fairbanks School of Public Health Alumni Board. The Alumni Association will host a live via Zoom event featuring a student and a faculty member. Each session will be recorded for individuals interested in the topic but unable to join us. I'm Alexandria Murphy, and I'm in my final year as a graduate, as a graduate student um, studying global health and sustainable development. And today I will be speaking with Dr. Max Moreno. Um, Dr. Max Moreno is an associate professor in the Department of Environmental Health Science within the Fairbanks School of Public Health at IUPUI. Um, Dr. Moreno and I will be speaking about country development level and evolution of H1N1 influenza as it pertains to spillover and spillbacks. Um, I don't know if they told you about this, but throughout the event, we're going to utilize the chat box below, click in the chat option, and it will open up a chat box on either side, um, either on the right side or the center of your screen. This is where you should type out questions for us or, or doctor, for us or to initiate a conversation with other participants. Um, once you finish typing your question, hit enter and feel free to either exit out of the chat box or leave it open to keep an eye, eye on site discussions that may be happening. Um, we are hoping for a robust conversation and we will be referring to questions at the halfway point of the session and at its conclusion. Um, so like they'll, we'll do a presentation and then there'll be a break for questions and then we'll continue on with the presentation and then we'll have time for a little bit more questions. Um, a few reminders about using Zoom, we'll have, we've automatically turned off your microphone and we'll attempt to keep everyone muted except for those speaking. So whether that's me or um, Dr. Moreno. Additionally, this session is being recorded for those who could not attend and we appreciate your willingness to connect virtually. On that note, let me do a more further introduction of Dr. Moreno. Dr. Moreno. Dr. Moreno received his bachelor's degree in zoo techniques from Universidad Nacional de Colombia and his master's degree in envi environmental management for sustainable development from the, I'm gonna do my best to pronounce this, um, from the Pon Pontificia Universidad Javerana. Maybe you could say this, um, Moreno, I do not know how to say this. Um, Dr. Moreno earned his PhD in public health with a concentration in environmental health from the University of South Florida School of Public Health, that I can say. And he completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center at Huntsville, Alabama. Dr. Merano is currently working to understand the relationship between surface water quality and human activity, as well as the influencing mechanisms of cultural and physical environmental detriments of zoonotic and water related vector transmitted diseases. <laughs> Without further delay, please join me in welcoming Dr. Moreno. Thank you, Alexandria. You're Thank welcome. you so much. So yes, I'm glad we finally were able to, to, to make it through to this uh, meeting. And uh, again, sorry to everyone for the difficulties we had, but the important thing is we are already here. So let's go then to the point. Um, I'm gonna share my screen so we can all see my... Uh, Presentation. Um, I think you can see my presentation now, right? My screen. Can you? Yes. Okay. okay. I can. Cool. All right. So then, um. Country development level and evolution of H1N1 influenza spillover or spillback. This is my presentation of today. Um, it's about infectious diseases, and we're talking about this in a time where worldwide the incidence of infectious diseases is decreasing, right? Because of the advance in medicine, the advance in infrastructure of uh, public health, and pharmaceuticals, for many reasons, and, uh, and the better uh, standard of living of our current technology that doesn't allow, as well as in, in the past, 
the transmission of infectious diseases, which are strongly associated to lack of sanitation, and sanitation has been strongly uh, addressed and improved uh, today. So because of those reasons, we have this lower incidence of infectious diseases. However, this is happening at the time where we are currently going through a pandemic and the conversation in public health is widely dominated by this infectious disease, COVID-19. And in fact, the number of uh, infectious disease outbreaks is on the rise. It's been increasing, especially in the last uh, um, dozens of years. But if we take a look to the timeline of the century, we also see that, in fact, the concentration of these uh, major infectious threats is increasing. You see that those uh, infectious threats are getting busier to the right of this uh, timeline axis of this uh, 21st century. Now, in that graphic, um, you see in red those who are pandemics, th those outbreaks, those epidemics that grow so much that go to the point of becoming a pandemic. So we have, of course, the current uh, COVID-19, and then we have the H1N1, which is the strain in, uh, which, about which we are going to talk today. So H1N1 has been the cause, I mean, strain uh, of this type has been the cause of many epidemics and several pandemics. In fact, if we go beyond this current century, we go to the last century, then we have the case of the Spanish flu in 1918. Um, which killed 50 million people. Uh, that was during a time where the world population was only 1.7 billion. So to put it in perspective, that same proportion in today's population, which we are almost uh, 8 billion people, that will be something about 220 million. Um, the current COVID pandemic uh, is close to 6 million. So you can see the difference and you can see uh, how hard, how tough that pandemic was of the 1918, which again was caused by an H1N1 virus. The same uh, a strain of the, the similar origin than the one of 2009. The, the pandemic of 2009 didn't kill that many people. There is still not a confident um, number uh, about the death toll, but it is estimated that it's probably about 500, 600 uh, people dead. Um, the, among the reasons why we don't know yet really what is the accurate number is because it's believed that many, probably most of the dead came from developing countries where there were not accurate uh, statistics, there were not uh, the appropriate uh, procedures and methodologies and technology to record the cases and to record the deaths. But it's believed that the mortality was much higher in developing countries, even though they are not reported as much in developing, in developing countries. But the point here is that all those um, uh, epidemics that happened and to those pandemics, the one of 1918 and the one of 2009 were caused by H1N1, the others, some of those were caused by avian flu. Uh, other was also caused, the Hong Kong, the, the one in 1968, was also caused by other swine flu because the H1N1 is commonly known as the swine flu because this strain is prevalent in swine. Now, that is talking about this century and the last century. If we increase the timeline, 
and we cover the last 300 years, we see that the path, there is a pattern of uh, pandemics caused by swine flu, and most of them by H1N1 flu, which is one of those uh, so-called swine flu. We see that this seems to happen in roughly uh, a given pattern, uh, interval of times. So it raised the question about if those pandemic might happen randomly or they might follow a pattern, some sort of a mathematical or statistic pattern. Uh, or if that pattern is given probably by some factors that, that influence the occurrence of those pandemics. Um, Actually, that will not explain why uh, this graphic seems to be busier to the right. And in, if we see at this graphic, we may see those like regular patterns, but probably it is that in the past it was kind of regular pattern, but then as some conditions in our, in our current environment are being more prevalent, then those factors that influence the possibility of the emergence of those outbreaks may be on the rise, then as a result, also the outbreaks may be on the rise. The interesting thing is that most of them are caused by swine flu, and most of those caused by swine flu are caused by H1N1, uh, the strain. So what is interesting about swine? Why, why would most of those uh, pandemic be caused by a strain of influenza that is uh, prevalent on swine? So that is what makes swine very interesting in this conversation. And, and it is related to the fact that swine are such a good mixing vessels they can be infected by strains prevalent on many other uh, species. So then by the fact that they can be infected by those strains from other species, then rise the possibility that as they meet in the swine, then they could exchange uh, genetic material. They could recombine the genetic material and then inherit condition from the different species. And in some of those combinations, probably could be one in which uh, will inherit all the negative aspect of each one of the species that conform the combination. In fact, uh, that is what is, has been proposed to maybe have been the cause of the Spanish flu, the, the, the pandemic of 1918. Um, there is the hypothesis that a uh, strain from an avian flu meet with the strain of human flu in the pigs. And then the, this uh, combination, this resulting uh, product for this combination inherit the characteristics of the avian flu to be very lethal to human and the characteristics of the uh, swine flu to be uh, more of the human flu to be very contagious to humans. So then the, the, both conditions being very contagious and being lethal mixed together in this strain and the result is 50 million people in a time where the population of the world was 1.7 billion. So that has not been fully proven by uh, phylogenetic analysis. However, this phylogenetic analysis have uh, shown clues that lead us think that that could be a feasible uh, way, it could be a physical probability. Uh, so, so there is a strong chance, even though it's not fully 
proven, but there is a strong chance that that was the case that what happened with this pandemic. And if that happened with that pandemic, chances are that it could happen again. And for instance, in the case of the swine flu of 2009, there were also uh, stains from avian flu, human flu, swine flu in the same strain. And then the part of the genetic material from swine flu seems to be also a combination from uh, swine flu from Europe and swine flu from um, Asia. So um, also there is the probability that all this combination happened naturally, spontaneously, probably with wild birds, um, probably migratory birds, uh, migratory birds as the name implied, they uh, migrate, they move from one place to another. So chances are that those birds may be able to bring pathogen from one place, migrate to another, and then transport it to another uh, place. So that is a possibility. And then in that new place, they may have come in contact with swine, with a farm, and then the mixing happen. So yes, that's a probability. However, the prevalent presence of swine flu in all those the possible combinations that have been found, it led scientists to think that probably that didn't happen naturally or spontaneously, but probably there is some human activity involved. In fact, there is a, a strong possibility for this because the chance that one of those combinations will happen is incredibly small, incredibly, incredibly small. The chance that among the so many possibilities, one of those will be able to infect humans as well is incredibly small. But there is also the possibility that that product of that combination will also slightly mutate. And that mutation, then if in the original combination, there, is, there was still not the ability to infect humans, then any future combination may have resulted in a strain that will be able to infect human, to jump to human. But still, that mutation to happen is also incredibly, incredibly uh, small, the probability. So incredibly unlikely. However, as unlikely as it is, this unlikely event increase with each transmission from one host to the other, from each mutation. So, you know, uh, mutation happen all the time. And um, but vast majority of mutations are negative to the organisms that mutate, but once in a while, one happen that is helpful to the host. So then the host can spread that uh, pathogen uh, more easily. So the success happen when in this is small possibility of a mutation that will change in that direction. So those mutations are unlikely to happen in natural conditions um, because in natural condition, transmission is not as prevalent. In natural condition, the hosts are separated. There, are, there is a low density of the susceptible host for pathogens, but then, in media, in environments that are controlled by human, then those conditions are not present, those conditions of low density. So a characteristic of uh, human activity um, in agriculture is the high density. Uh, with the growing population, we have this increasing demand for food. And industrial agriculture has been called to be one 
of the pathway by which humans are called to obtain that uh, extra amount of food for this uh, growing population. So industrial animal agriculture has been becoming more prevalent and this type of agriculture has the characteristic that has high density of the same species. In other words, what is called as monoculture. So by monoculture, we understand the, the, the growth, the rise of animals of the same species. So what this imply that if there is a pathogen that can infect one individual, then that pathogen can infect all the individual of that population because they all will be equally susceptible to the same pathogen. Then, which each jump, which is transmission from one pathogen, from one host to the next, there is this incredibly small chance for a mutation to happen, which is insignificant, right? But if you consider that in animal agriculture, you may have 20,000 susceptible hosts, then you will have 20,000 transmission, 20,000 mutation, then what will be an insignificant chance from one host to the next now may not be uh, insignificant anymore. So then, that's what it make it feasible or it make it to have a lot of sense that probably human activity has been involved in those process of emergence of these novel pathogens like the ones of H1N1 that have caused uh, pandemics. Now, uh, in the past, industrial agriculture was not prevalent, and we know the timeline that I showed before that there have been pandemic in the last 300 years, and very likely even before, but there is a better record uh, in recent times. So at the time there was not uh, animal agriculture, industrial agriculture, so then you could not blame industrial agriculture in the emerging of those, uh, of those uh, pandemics. However, if we see that uh, timeline axis in 2000 and the present, and we see how it becoming busier uh, in the current times, then we might think that those type of pandemics, they might be like uh, naturally occurring at some kind of intervals during the time, but with the growth of the factors that increase the risk of those conditions to happen, then probably those intervals between pandemic will be going shorter and shorter as the conditions that facilitate the emergence of pathogens become more prevalent. What conditions are those? Deforestation, urbanization, the grow, urban, uh, the grow population, uh, climate change, and industrial animal agriculture. All those factors are on the rise and all of them lead to the possibility of contact between species and between uh, pathogen from different species. So uh, even though if that, that uh, happened, let's say the mutation uh, of a pathogen making it able to be jumped to human, still that possibility will still be also low for that human to transmit the pathogen to another human. And that, and that can be explained with uh, natural system, with natural evolution. Pathogens, they evolve toward being mild to the host. Why they evolve? They tend, this is the natural tendency. Pathogens tend to be to evolve toward being mild to the host because it's not in the interest of the pathogen to kill the host. If the pathogen kills the host, transmission is stopped right there. So 
uh, in the possibility of mutations, in the number of mutations that could happen, um, they could more certainly, as I say, it's very rarely they could they could uh, be uh, able to infect other species, but in but in general they could try to uh, select for those ones that increase the possibility of transmission. So of all the number of huge number of mutations that may happen, uh, the one that will increase the success of transmission that will be the one that will stay and that will be inherited in future in future generations so then so what is the interesting point here that if there is a mutation that changes toward being harm to to cause harm to the host then let's say let's say for instance in the case of humans um right now with the current COVID, you know there have been many strains and there have been uh, delta now omicron uh there have been a huge number much greater than that of mutation but see some of those mutations lead toward being more harmful more virulent the people the person the host that receive the pathogen with that mutation will stay on bed. So by staying on bed, it will not walk to come in contact with other susceptible hosts. So that mutation will not have chance of success. It will not have chance of spreading into other susceptible hosts. On the other hand, if there is a mutation that changes toward being mild, then the host having the pathogen with that mutation will still be able to walk. So by being able to walk, he will come in contact with other susceptible hosts. He will take the bus, he will go to class, he will go to the supermarket because the mutation was toward being mild. So then the person keep mobile. By being mobile, he keep in contact with other susceptible hosts. So then that mutation will have chance of success so then evolution will tend toward producing pathogens that are mild to the host for which they are evolving so the host evolved toward being resistant to the pathogen and the pathogens evolved toward being mild to that host that is the normal uh, tendency. However, um, what happened in the condition in the environment of high density, like for instance, in a crowded city, in the case of humans as a host, or in the case of a big barn, an industrial barn for swine, that there is a high density. And having too many susceptible hosts next to each other, shoulder to shoulder, it make it that the pathogen really is not now so urged to evolve toward being mild because even if the host gets sick and doesn't move, it still will be in contact with the next susceptible host. So then those conditions of high density probably change that natural tendency of pathogens to evolve toward mildness because in that case there is no need for the host to move in order to spread the pathogen even if it's very sick and doesn't move still next to it there is another peak so then that those conditions may increase the chance for those pathogens to become virulent so then that make it uh, especially uh, worrisome that condition of the high density and in general the fact that industrial agriculture uh, is called to being coming increasingly more prevalent as there is increasing need for food um 
Now, what happened with the with the um, uh, the swine flu of 2009 and the Spanish flu of uh, 1918 might have many things in common, but also has a diff different condition. Other things that are not similar. Um, the swine flu of 2009 happened in a time where we already have industrial agriculture. The, the Spanish flu of 2018 happened when there was still not uh, industrial agriculture. So you really could not use this hypothesis of the high density to explain the possibility of that emergence of that mixing of avian flu and human flu in the in a swine. Um, at least it's not as prevalent the probability, but it still is there because there were still farms back in those times. So um, it doesn't remove the possibility that could, that could be a factor, but, but uh, at, at least it's not so easy explained as a potential factor as it is in the case of the swine flu of 2009. Now, when, when the, the as, as I was saying, evolution will keep trying to make the pathogen natural conditions uh, mild, and that may explain why today we have a variant of the H1N1 flu that caused the Spanish flu. So the Spanish flu killed 50 million at the time, but today the Spanish flu is one of those that caused the regular seasonal flu that uh, just uh, caused this annoyance that we are so familiar with it every year, but really that we are not really scared or worried about the possibility of dying because of that seasonal flu. Even though, yes, that killed people, but killed a relatively small number of people, so relatively small that um, it's not a concern um, the, amount, the, 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 the mortality that could be caused by that. Even, and it's the same one of 1918. It's just that as the, pathogen first was able to jump to humans. When they first jump to humans, they tend to be harmful for the reasons I just explained, because they are not yet adjusted to the new host. But as they jump to that host and then time pass and they, they change and they, they evolve and they adjust to that host, then they become mild, just like the H1N1 variant that was so little in, in 1918, today is just a regular seasonal flu. That may also explain why the current SARS-CoV-2 was more little at the beginning, and now we have the uh, Omicron strain, which is not so little, but more infectious because that is the direction of evolution toward being more infectious, but being less lethal. And they want, again, they want to be less lethal because they want to continue the transmission and transmission don't happen when people is sick on bed. So there is this uh, interesting study that was conducted around uh, the um, swine flu of 2009. And it shows that at the same time, when the cases were happening on humans, they were also cases happening in species, in different species of animals. So it was detected, the H1N1 was detected in dogs, in ferret, in turkey, in cat, and also in pigs. But the vast majority of those cases on animals were present in pigs. Now, when they analyzed worldwide, um, and they, they realized that some countries 
detect the presence of the H1N1 in animals and some other country uh, and in animals and humans and some other countries only detected the presence of these strains in in humans. So we kind of uh, see in this map that the developing countries tend seems to be they tend to be like those that only have cases of H1N1 in humans. And then countries to the north and to the south, which usually tend to be those more industrialized, uh, they, they have both human cases and animal cases. Now, developed countries, those two, uh, that are more industrialized, are also those more likely to have industrial agriculture. So that makes us also wonder if industrial agriculture may have something to do with uh, the swine flu of 2009, or maybe just simple, simple coincidence. But interesting thing here is that we will expect, in fact, if the, the emergence of this pathogen may have come from an industrial agricultural setting, then we probably will expect cases to happen first in barns, in pigs, in, in swine, before than in humans. But that was not the case. Um, the data shows that cases seem to have happened first in humans and later on the swine. So this pathogen is known as uh, sonotic, uh, sonotic in origin, right? Mm, some say that it's really not sonotic because it was so easily spread from human to human. So um, if the spread happened from human to human, the uh, definition of sonotic doesn't apply so strongly because by sonotic we understand a pathogen that jumped from animal to humans. But in this case, that this, this, there was a huge spread between human to human. That pathogen was very efficient at transmitting from human to human. However, it still is considered sonotic in origin because the first um, spillover, the first jump, seems to have happened from swine to human. So it still is called um, sonotic in origin. However, the fact that cases were found after, once the epidemic spread and become a pandemic, cases were found in swine later a period of days after they were found in human, raised the question about if probably the swine got the infection from human. That, that will be something like a spillback because uh, the first spillover, okay, the first origin was from swine, but then probably the pathogen as the jump to swine keep evolving, uh, sorry, to jump to human, keep evolving on humans, and somehow may still keep the ability to infect swine. So in conditions like in a barn, in an industrial animal agriculture, where you have workers and swine in close contact, then probably that infection could jump from the workers back to the swine. So then in that case, you could talk about uh, sort of a spillback. Then the question comes, uh, what was first, the eggs or the chicken? It really come from humans to swine or uh, from swine to humans, or there is probably the chance that really it goes from humans to, to swine. So, the answer is uh, not known, but a possibility explaining the fact that this data show the cases being happening first in humans than in animals might be due just to confounding factors. Um, because countries that are less developed are less likely to report the, the cases on time and countries that are more developed are more likely to report the cases on time. So in this same study, they did uh, an association. They studied the correlation between the interval, the time between detection 
in humans and the time of detections in swine. And they try to look for an association in the different countries between that interval of times and the gross domestic product in that country. So they, they found that there is a tendency that the more, the higher the gross domestic product, the shorter is the period of time between detection in humans and swine. So a possibility is that it's just that uh, these uh, industrial agriculture more likely happen in developed countries and developed countries have a better public health infrastructure and better surveillance, better system systems to report cases. Then in developing countries, um, those systems are weaker uh, and they may not even detect those in animals, even though they have been in animals. So the lack of detection in developing countries doesn't necessarily mean that there were not cases also in swines, but it's just that probably the detection uh, for the reporting of uh, infection in animals is lower. Also, since those reports are more likely to happen in industrialized barns, then and, and those industrial barns are less common in developing countries, then uh, if infection happen in a regular artisanal the family exploitation of pigs, probably chances are that detection is ne never going to be is never going to happen. So that infection is not going to be reported. So there is a plenty of chance for for confounding for confounding factors in there. So the study showed something different that actually the cases of infections from uh, but this is not specifically to, to H1N1 uh, or swine flu in general, but in general to zoonotic. So contrary to what the other studies show that cases show first in humans and then in animals, uh, this other study showed that a good way to prevent the possibility of emergence of uh, novel pathogens in humans is to monitor first uh, the wild population and then the domestic population. And then when it's detected in first in wild and then in domestic, then can be expected the possibility, the, the, the probability of, a, of occurrence in humans. So in the wild, they happen in regular intervals, but they don't grow the peaks of um, incidents are not high. They just happen regularly. Uh, in domestic animals, the peak can be very high. Of course, in, in, in the wild ecosystem, they are self-controlled. There are predators, there are prey. So the predator keep the prey on check. So by doing that, the prey, which are usually those who are hosts of pathogens, they don't grow in numbers, they don't increase in high density. So the possibility of uh, a transmission is controlled. So it happened, but it happened controlled. Those conditions that regulate the abundance of species of host and the incidence of those diseases don't happen in, in, in domestic, in human, mediated environment in animal agriculture. So as a result, then you have peak much higher. If you, when you see that the peak is growing, then on uh, domestic animals, then you can expect that will follow a peak on humans. So then that has a, a different order. That's an order that makes sense. That's an that's a order that make it possible, the probability that the finding of the other study may just be due to a confounding factors. But still, there is the question about if it go, in what direction 
there is more uh, is it more probably to 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 happen this infection now even in the case that the infection happened back from animals to humans uh, still is very important to keep in mind that for the possibility that is that some diseases that uh, has um, okay they initially jump from animals to humans and then they are present in humans and they probably disappear in humans uh, but if they can be transported back to animals then they can stay in animals even though they have disappeared in humans so then that's the concern with the swine because they could serve as a reservoir that will keep pathogens that have already disappeared among humans and could eventually go back again. So in other words, we could have this constant back and forth between animals and humans, between swine and humans, and that could allow for the possibility of uh, pathogens that have been controlled or have been disappeared among human population to go back again in the future. Uh, in fact, that seems to be something that happened with the Spanish flu because there was a period of time where the H1N1 that caused the Spanish flu, uh, it was not detected, it disappeared from the picture. And then after a period of time, it appears again. So where it came from? So probably it was a store it was uh, kept in swine and then another chance from uh, uh, jumping back to humans happened. So talking about, um, oh, by the way, I think we already, I was supposed to talk by 50 minutes. Uh, I think we are supposed to have a break. Uh, Alexandria, should we have a short break before we continue. I think that was the way the presentation was designed to be. Um, Max, Alexandria had to um, pop off for 1 p.m. meeting, but we can take questions now. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, so yeah, I think we're supposed to, to take a short break uh, for questions and then we can renew with, uh, with uh, I mean, if there are questions so, so far, let me, is there, are there any questions or, or I should continue? Let me see. There was one question in the chat. Someone was asking what would be good ways to break up some of the patterns of influenza gaining hyper, virulence from the confined feeding operations? Well, uh, definitely uh, having a good method of safety and biosafety in the agricultural settings. Um, so the industry, the pork industry is aware of these risks and they are improving constantly the safety, the biosafety, by making sure there is no people entering into the barns other than the workers, and making sure that the workers keep all the measure of uh, self-protection, uh, like the personal protective equipment, um, not allowing uh, windows that, uh, that will allow the possibility of aerosol to be released, even though this is this is a um, um, kind of uh, controversy because at the same time as windows could help um, dilute the environment inside, if there is a wind, they could also transport it to the barn next door. But in general, having good measure of biosafety is one of the reasons uh, that will really keep the possibility of uh, emergence of using those settings as a possible source of a novel uh, pathogen. So a strong surveillance in those settings and also a strong surveillance in human settings in, 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 in cities. 
Uh, so that is key, detecting the first cases in both human settings and animal settings and uh, avoiding as much as possible exposure uh, by controlling those factors that are immediately the main cause of risk, we control the possibility of having those problems. Now, um, you could go much further than that, but then that could go beyond our hands. When we go to, of course, control climate change, obviously that would be one way, but uh, good luck doing that. We are trying to do that for many reasons, not just for controlling novel pathogens. Uh, control deforestation, um, control advance of agriculture into wild wetlands and wild forests. So all those, controlling all those factors, we will decrease the possibility of this type of risk. But then that is some sort of like way uh, beyond our hands. So what is more in our hands to control um, is basically these confined animal operations that could really be monitored strongly and be subject of attention and, and measures to prevent that, uh, that, that sort of risk. So in that, we can measure and we can see a result of an effect of our actions in the other worldwide things like controlling globalization, controlling um, transport of people, potentially carrying pathogens, that goes a little beyond, beyond our hands. That's it. Uh, I hope that uh, address uh, the questions. That question um, is- it it? Okay. Thank you, Max. Uh, you're, uh, you're very welcome. And you have some kudos in the chat saying, what an interesting presentation this was. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, you okay, uh, so if there are no more questions, I think I can go back. Um, the thing is that I am, okay, I am still sharing. No, I am not sharing my screen. Let me share my screen. And let's go back with this again. Okay, so now I have the. Okay, why these slides show NAFTA? Um, I was, in fact, when I was responding to the previous question, I was talking about uh, globalization and trading. Um, the increasing trade is one of those factors that are listed among those that increase the possibility of the emergence of novel pathogens and the occurrence of uh, epidemics from zoonotic diseases. Uh, of course, uh, because it implies transport of goods that could transport vectors of infectious diseases and also include transport of people. It makes it easy to travel, and uh, which imply uh, the potential transport of, of pathogens. But another reason why uh, globalization is such an important factor in regard to the risk of emergence of novel pathogens, and in this case of H1N1. Uh, could be the fact that the globalization tend toward free market, uh, free trade. There is a growing number of free trade agreements. And it's especially interesting, this one that uh, came into effect in 1994, NAFTA, that free trade between Canada, Mexico, and United States. Because there is an author, uh, Bob Wallace, who link this uh, trade, this free trade agreement with the swine flu, the H1N1 flu of 2009. So the rationale is this. Those free trade uh, agreements, they usually include uh, foreign direct investment chapter. 
So what does it mean that is that the countries that uh, agree to transport the goods between them, they also agree to allow the um, transport of money to uh, create factories in the other countries and create the products in that other country that, uh, that uh, make part on this agreement. So then with NAFTA, there was a huge uh, company that produced uh, swine meat, and they took advantage of this agreement by transporting the factory, the farm, the factory farm to Mexico, looking for uh, lower, uh, for cheaper labor, and more relaxed uh, environmental regulations. Um, then they create this factory in Mexico. Um, it's probably no coincidence that the first cases of swine flu of 2009 were detected in Mexico and then in the United States and, and in Canada. So it seems that a possibility is that with the um, operation of this huge industrial swine farm in Mexico, something may have to do with the fact that the pathogens emerged first in there. So, so that is just a possibility, uh, but that's a possibility that if it, that is, was the case, that similar conditions happen worldwide with the tendency for foreign direct investment to um, transport those industrial setting to developing countries where regulations are more relaxed and where the labor is much cheaper. Um, and I can move to the next slide, but I don't know what's happening. Sorry, something freeze in my computer. Okay. So then, um, okay, so then uh, developing countries, they are yes, more likely to receive this influx of uh, funding for uh, exploitation for human activity that may not uh, be very safe but that are more likely to happen in those countries since regulations are more relaxed. But that's not uh, the only way in which um, developing countries will play a role in this risk. And it has been um, formulated by some authors that in general, developing countries are far more likely to be the source of uh, epidemics for many reasons, not just for those that I mentioned that they may also receive this influx of uh, industrial farming tends to the cheap labor, but also uh, because if those emergencies happen, then those countries have a much poorer public health infrastructure. They have much less resources, uh, pharmaceutical resources like uh, um, less availability to pharmaceutical uh, resources like uh, vaccines, like uh, antiviral drugs. Um, and of course, they have much lower clinical and public health infrastructure. So in fact, that is one of the reasons that uh, has been shown as a surprise why the swine flu didn't detect as many cases in, in developing countries, at least, for instance, in the case of Africa. Um, and also, it happened that many, because um, the safety in the agriculture in those places is far more, low, is far more relaxed, then also uh, there is a concern for, for instance, in regard to H1N1, because the Southeast Asia uh, is 
very strong, very prevalent in that type of production of, of swine. And the, by the most part, this production of swine in this region of the world, it doesn't meet the standards that we have in developed countries. So that means that you will be increasingly having more high densities of swines in an area where there are not the conditions um, to control. There are not the conditions to provide the good surveillance, the appropriate surveillance, the appropriate measure of uh, biosafety uh, that we see here in developed countries. Uh, so then that that is a risk. So then it's not just that there is increasing possibility of emergence on those uh, type of places because of the lack of infrastructure, but also once emerge, they are also those more likely to suffer the consequence. And we see here what happened with uh, the current pandemic of COVID. Um, we see how the incidence was much higher in minorities in the case of the United States. And in also in developing countries was also high. It is interesting that in Africa, it was not as high. And also in Africa, the swine flu also was not detected, detected as high, which uh, would kind of contradict this hypothesis. Uh, but in general, the logic uh, point to the fact that developing countries are not just more likely as a source of those uh, spillover of those novel pathogens, but also those more likely to suffer the consequence because of the limitations to deal with those uh, problems. Now, so far, the manage the management of pandemics has been more toward cleaning than toward preventing. But um, looking at those pipelines that I show initially in this presentation, we see that they can they, they will happen, that they will repeat at some interval period of time. And if we analyze just what is happening in the 21st century, we see that they seems to be happening not just a regular interval of time, but even being decreasing in that interval and being increasingly busier and more and more common. So of course, that call for the need to see what are the factors and, and that is related to the question that just happened previously. Uh, what are the factors that lead to those conditions? Um, so the way is just to act on those factors in order to uh, diminish or decrease the possibility of this to, to happen. So again, those factors are the protection, uh, urbanization, growing animal agriculture, uh, globalization. And then the importance to provide to put in place a strong surveillance at all levels at the level of the industry, of the agricultural industry that is uh, supposed to be the risk of the potential source of um, those pathogens, as well as surveillance in communities in general, in countries in general, to detect those right from the beginning. Um, and of course, to implement a very strict biosafety, which again is less likely to happen in developing countries. So with this, um, I come to the end of this presentation, which I think I extended a little bit uh, the supposed time, which was supposed to finish at one, but Given that we start late, I think we took exactly one hour. <clears throat> so yeah, thank, thank you, you everyone for, for joining today. Um, does anybody else have any final questions for Dr. Moreno? Okay, great. Well, thanks for joining us today. Um, and thank you, Dr. Moreno, for, for your great presentation. 
with pleasure. Yep. Thank you.